Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience. I wanted to start by asking you um, if you still went by screaming, uh, Scott, and then you log on and your little ID name came up as screaming, Scott. So I guess the answer is you still go by screaming. Well, because out of respect for my good friend and NPR host, mm. Scott Simon. True. Yes. Um, and he's had me on his show, and I've met him when he was on one of his book tours. And his wife, then fiance, admitted that she told her parents she was getting engaged to Scott Simon, and they said, we love his music. <laughs> I love it. So he and I have, have become brethren under the same name, but in case anybody wants to tune in to hear Scott Simon, uh, 9 a.m. on NPR on the weekend. Right. You guys probably get your mail, each other's reason. mail a lot. Right. Yeah. You don't need to say Screaming Scott a thousand times. Okay, well, thank you, Screaming. Um. <laughs> This is Why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. How did the band come together? Because in my mind, I have this vision of you guys hanging out on a stoop in front of a brownstone. Of course. No, you're shaking your head no. No. Okay. Um, an Ivy League, like the, uh, at Columbia University, like the Whiffen Poofs were mm -hmm. at Yale. Okay. Double Octet. Uh, a cappella group occasionally had a guy play guitar to accompany them. They wore blue blazers. They were the King's men, Columbia being King's College. And trivia was invented by their first manager, Ed Goodgold, along with Dan Karlinski, and he had them sing Little Darlin at a trivia contest in 1967. And then it slowly graduated to doing a whole show choreographed uh, the older brother of the president of the Kingsman, George Leonard, had this idea. And it's very modern. The past is always the father of the present. Mm -hmm. He had this idea that the tension on the Columbia campus in 1969 was caused because the jocks who lived in fraternity row and had crew cuts and the pukes who lived in... Uh, you know, th two bedroom apartments on the Upper West Side while they went to Columbia, the hippies um, could come together at an event where they both went back in their closet and embraced their communal love for the music they grew up with. And that we should find our communality, not uh, constantly aggravate our differences. And it's the same story today. <laughs> but yeah. um, it was, it was purely a campus event, the glory that was Greece, long before there was a show called Greece. And then there was a night show at the end of that June, May school year, the glory that was Greece. Uh, Greece under the stars, this was at Low Library. And then they went and played at Steve Paul's scene, which was the scene, um, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Hendrix embraced the band because it was his music. He was 25 mm. years old. Yeah. He was the real 50s, 60s. That was his high school music. Sure. So he insisted that the band go on at Woodstock before he would go on last. And they went on at six in the morning on the last morning. And that minute and 26 seconds of At The Hop became uh, a calling card for a band that didn't have a, I mean, it was a show. There was even my brother-in-law, one of my brothers-in-law said, oh, I just read a thing that uh, Shanana Woodstock was the beginning of the MAGA looking back experience because nostalgia and uh, glory of the days of yore, the, that, that the good stuff had already passed us by and we needed to make rock and roll great again. But we don't take any credit for Monica. I'm just saying that. None. Yeah, completely fair. Yeah. So how did you get involved? Were you part of uh, the original group, the, the Kings? I, wa I wasn't, actually. Um, I was a student at Columbia with a blues band, the 
while they were at Woodstock, we were at the Cafe Bazaar on West Third Street playing seven nights a week, nine to one. Although on the weekend it'd be nine to four with a second band, the Musonic Plague from New Jersey. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and you know the moon landing and Woodstock and all of that. So these guys who were preppy, acapella, uh, glee club were at Woodstock and we're in the trenches at the Cafe Bazaar. In any case, the original piano player, my friend Joe Whitkin, was graduating in April of 1970. Now this is after the Woodstock show and the movie and leaving the group to go to medical school. These are Ivy League guys. Yeah. And they put a note in the uh, Columbia Spectator daily newspaper looking for a guitarist because Henry Gross was leaving, having seen Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock, Henry, the youngest performer at Woodstock, 17 years old, and the only non-Columbia original guy. He went to Brooklyn College. Come on, Henry. Amateur. <laughs> in any case, he boys. saw Hendrix and realized he needed to pursue his musical dream and was leaving the group at the same time his buddy from Brooklyn, Joe Whitkin, was leaving. I auditioned and I got a job with the band that got its name from Get a Job. Sha -da -da -da. <laughs> yeah. And joined in April of 70, and that was my debut with the band. So you were really thrown into the deep end. Say it again. You were really thrown into the deep end because you guys were playing uh, the film well, at that point. Well, I I had had enough time with the Royal Pythons to be a hardworking musician. And, and I had done theater in high school. So it was a combination of theatrical rock, but we always, we, uh, even the Pythons celebrated oldies and blues. And as far as sure, you know, if you're a performer pursuing, I was graduating college with a double minor in music and uh, English literature. So, Hand in <laughs> what was I going to do with that degree? So uh, I got a job, and, and I wanted to be. And as the band ch turned over people over the years, people would leave to go to grad school or whatever. If you look up Shanana's uh, alumni, we have the most graduate degrees of any group in the history of rock and roll. All these guys are doctors, lawyers, professors the original guys, and they would be replaced by guys who wanted to make music their career. So by the time we got to the TV show, it was 12 down to 10. And the last iteration of the band was seven on stage. Okay, that's a big band, even at seven. Even at seven, but you know, a guitar player, a bass player, a drummer, a piano player, a sax player, and a couple of singers. That's For a doo-wop group, you need at least four voices. True. Mm -hmm. Good point. That's amazing. Well, and I used to watch the TV show religiously. They're all on YouTube, by the way. I know. I have been known to uh, find them every now and so, again. So it's an interesting... Uh, I've been looking through them lately myself, seeing songs I don't even remember uh, singing. And there's also this thing that in the fourth season, our guitar player, Dirty Dan McBride, kind of dropped out. And we were going to the season without a lead guitar player. So when it comes to guitar lead, I was not a real guitar player, could mime guitar leads, and was seen playing solos that we had a studio guy who came on the road with us, Glenn Jordan, play, but he was never on camera. We had no guitar player on camera unless one of us stood in. So as you're looking through that season four, Heidi, yes, I'm gonna look that watch that. my left hands. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. That's what I'm gonna do when we hang up. So what was what was the thought on doing the show? Because it seems like you guys weren't motivated by let's get into acting and let's do television. It was always was it just sort of the another way to expand the Shanana brand, as it were? Oh, definitely that. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, we've done, variety television was really changing right then. And MTV came to the fore, and all the music migrated to cable channels. And we were one of the last variety shows, us, Sonny and Cher. These were variety shows that 
the year before us, it, it was it was called uh, Prime Access, 7.30 to 8 o'clock, right before prime time, family shows. And they were looking for a family show. They had Andy Williams the previous year, our producer, the late great Pierre Cassette, had 24 shows of Andy Williams, sponsored by Procter & Gamble. And they were looking for a younger demographic because as usual, uh, Procter & Gamble is trying to sell their product to single women, 18 to 35. It was a very targeted demographic, people who would buy Joy, Jif, Tide, whatever. And we filled the bill. They had originally wanted to get the Beach Boys, then they were too old. They couldn't be called boys anymore. And, uh, and it, it just hit a sweet spot for Procter & Gamble to sponsor a show. Um, and for us, it was like the last place to go. We were never really gonna have a hit record. Mm -hmm. The Grease album certainly sold multi, multi millions. It did over right six cuts on that. But uh, as far as art, we always were an audio visual show. So it was kind of a natural transition to be able to do comedy, so to speak. And uh, guest, when you look at the roster of guests and who Procter & Gamble was approving, it was only one from James Brown to Freddie Fender and back. Uh, they found they they soon found that the country audience in the Midwest was a crossover to the rock and roll audience. Sure. And we had Tommy Twitty, we had Barbara Mandrell, we had uh, Dottie West, we had endless supply of guests, along with Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Freddie Cannon, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm assuming uh, from a personal set side, you don't have to tour or you can't tour when you're shooting sure. a show. Well, you can't. Or did management find a way to, yeah, <laughs> to make that happen? Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, it's a five or six day a week job for those, and there were twenty four shows per season. So we do eight or twelve shows in a block. You pre record all the music. Only the lead vocals were live, so that it looked like that guy was singing, because uh, he was, <laughs> and. Uh, and we do all the tracks for the guests too. So very, you'll, you'll see me playing an organ solo on I Will Survive with Gloria Gaynor standing by, you know, and that's like, <laughs> ah, we're a disco band, you know. There were many times when they felt we jumped the shark with the Ramones. How can you guess the Ramones? Well, we invented the Ramones, come on. Where did the <laughs> black leather jackets came from? That's so uh, true. Anyway. It was quite a it was quite a, an experience, and then we would tour Labor Day from the Fourth of July to Labor Day. Come back in October, make the other twelve shows, and then February and March do another seven or eight weeks on the trot. We were like wrestling, entertainment wrestling. People who had never left their house to see a live show, grannies, multi generational people, in Wheeling, West Virginia, we'd sell it out on a Tuesday night, and then go. 200 miles down the road for Wednesday night and book that part of the country for Tuesday through Sunday, fly on Monday to South Carolina, do the Carolinas the next week. And it would be one nighter after one nighter with only Mondays off for seven or eight weeks on the trot. So was that invigorating or was it exhausting? We were young and invulnerable. It was amazing. Uh, of course, now I've lost most of my hearing. Uh, no, it was, it's what is what you were trying to do. I mean, the first time we played Madison Square Garden, and it's like I'm playing Madison Square Garden. Yeah, it's an adrenaline thing that you can't match, or Carnegie Hall, or Shea Stadium, or any of these places. And you look back, we had a very notable group of uh, venues that we played in over the years. Yeah, and I mean, on top of that, I mean the the folks who you played with and opened for, um, I mean, The Grateful Dead, Mothers of Invention, The right. Kinks, Springsteen. No, Springsteen you... opened for us. Oh, he opened for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, many of these people opened to us because what happened was even The Dead in the, at the Fillmore East in August, the same month as Woodstock, 69, uh, they found they couldn't follow us. And so they said, well, we'd like to go on before you. We got somewhere to go. <laughs> 
And so very early in the group's career, we became headliners because nobody wanted to follow us. We were a natural grouping with open to Joan Rivers. Well, no, Joan couldn't follow 10 or open to Dionne Warwick. Uh, and she asked, please never to William Warren, please <laughs> never do that again. Right, like that was a terrible idea. <laughs> that was because we were at Ohio State homecoming and people came greased oh. and dressed and totally drunk. Yes. And she couldn't follow that. No. And that was the assigned stage. Yeah. No. <laughs> and also you, you played with John and Yoko at their benefit at Madison Square Garden. Yes. And I get the impression this was John's music. This is something he loved and cared for deeply. Well, it was, he, he was with Elephant's Memory at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Really guys from the Bronx. And there were two shows, an afternoon show and an evening show when they found the first show sold out instantly. And then it was being taped for ABC special, the one-to-one -one concert with Phil Spector in the truck producing who came rushing backstage to our dressing room to say, you guys are playing these songs too fast. You're killing them. I produced a lot of these records and why do you, but that was our signature is to play for the dancing and the show, sure. not for the tempo of the record. In any case, I did have one moment with John. There were two Wurlitzer keyboards set up on the left of the stage. And the second show, they said, Hound Dog, his encore, everybody on stage. So Yoko's on stage, and she's sitting at the Wurlitzer with her legs up like this in her <laughs> pantsuit and just going like this. And it was in the monitors, but hopefully not in the house. And I was sitting at John's Wurlitzer, and she gets bored with the whole thing and just leaves uh, and gets in their town and country a uh, woody uh, side station wagon, which they drove around New York in. And she's sitting backstage in the station wagon. John looks over, oh, Yoko's gone. John to me. <laughs> and I go, she's out of here. Takes off his guitar, walks off. The music's still going on. There's no John and Yoko. The show's over, but nobody knows it. But the guys on stage are looking around right. and going, how do we end this thing? <laughs> right. Figured out how to end it. Oh, my God. But we appreciated being involved in that event and the feeling that he understood that our roots in rock and roll and his were not that different. You listen to Meet the Beatles. Mm -hmm. It's an oldies album. Yeah. Well, when you look at what he played on rock and roll, which was so much similar rock and roll, yes, records, mm -hmm. you know, that you guys both listen to. Absolutely. And, and then, of course, probably your your best known appearance and the one that um, my eight year old gets very excited for. Greece. I'm sorry, which one? What? The, the, your appearance in Greece. Uh, my eight year old. Big fan. Yes. Oh, as Johnny Casino and the Gamblers? Yes, yes. The gamblers. and I've been yes. corrected that it's not actually Sha Na Na. It's another band. They're being played by Sha Na Na. That uh, is correct. We were billed. We didn't get individual billing. Our billing is Sha Na Na. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I was able to get my name onto the screen uh, by co-writing Sandy, Sandy yes. for John Travolta. How did that come about? Because, I mean, the film's a musical. It's yes. lousy with songs. I know, but well, this... there well, were four no, no, songs. No, no, no. There were four songs in the movie that were not in the musical, mm -hmm. and all the songs in the musical were like "Born to Hand Jive." It's just hand jive reworked, right. mm -hmm. and most of these songs were like oldies pastiche. Not to take anything away from the guys that wrote it. On the one hand, on the other hand there really wasn't a hit record in there. And here's Olivia Newton-John and her producer coming in, John Ferra, John Ferrar, for you who speak English. He's Australian. Uh, and he had written Hopelessly Devoted for her as her point number. And then You're the One That I Want as the big ending number. And these were new tunes. They were not in the book show. The opening 
Frankie Valley song written by uh, Barry Mann, the Bee Gees, not Barry Mann, Barry Gibb. Um, Grease is the word, a disco song. Yeah. Somehow it worked. And that was not in the book show. And then John Travolta had been in the book show as duty when he was an emancipated teen in New Jersey. He was in, in the Broadway show. That was his first professional gig. So he knew that the song for Danny was sung by Barry Bostwick in the Broadway show. I'm all alone at the drive-in alley. And it was played for laughs. It was not, and she's singing hopelessly devoted and he's singing some, you know. So he put the word out and it literally, as we're recording our songs, I see this thing in the LA Times saying, John Travolta looking for something. And, and wrote, just sat down and wrote, stranded at the drive, and branded a pool. What will they say Monday at school? And Louis St. Louis, who was the musical director, um, was sitting on the piano bench with me while we were recording our songs. I said, I have some song, I have some, some idea for a song. He says, I have some idea for a song. They're shooting it next Thursday. <laughs> but of course. And it was Wednesday, you know, oh. a week away. So we went to his hotel room that night, wrote that song. And at the time they didn't have Grease is the Word either. We wrote a second song, which appears now the music under the, where they're racing in the, at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a song Greased Up and Ready that's now background music. In any case, we wrote it. He played it for John, played it for the, the producers. Everybody loved it. They did it the next week. It's so good. It's good so fortune. good. To, uh, right time, right place. It's such a good song, though. It's such a great, like, just belt it out. Both of those, both, they just a perfect bookend, his and hers. Right. Great. And, and um, I think the vulnerability of a guy saying, I've been branded a fool. What will they say at school? Right. <laughs> and, Takes you, know, you back that, to realizing they're high school students, not 30 year olds, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, somebody made a point the other day when Olivia passed away very recently, mm -hmm. and I did a couple of interviews, and somebody said, uh, a guy who writes for Goldmine Magazine, Warren Kurtz, said, uh, you know, you, she was the same age as the guys in Shanana, but she pulled off being a teenager, which means she was 29 years old mm -hmm. when the movie was made. But let's be honest, she could pull off being a teenager right up to the end. I mean, she was just stunningly, just everything that effervesced from her was youthful and amazing. Yes, youthful and hopeful, mm -hmm. uh, facing a, a situation which, you know, yeah. None of us have to face. But we worked with her again um, at, at the Flamingo Hilton where she had a, her own show. And then we played a VIP show for her foundation that they, and she came upstairs and then welcomed everybody and took pictures with us and stuff like that. But she never really knew who we were. Wow. We we're just some guys, you know. I knew John, John Farah, because he played guitar on Sandy. He had been in the shadows. He had his whole oh. musical career as a guitarist before he became her producer and songwriter. Great guy, great guy. Very humble and very giving. What do you remember about that shoot at the, the dance-off? It was really hot. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Uh, movie lighting indoors in the middle of the summer at Huntington High School. Um, and the fact that every member of the cast was in that scene. Yeah. Mm. Which is remarkable if you think of a cast of 160, you know, 120 dancers, 20 principal dancers, all the stars, and Sid Caesar, and, 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 and all these people. So it was, they were mostly concerned with getting the dancing and getting the plot moving along where he winds up with cha-cha, she winds up out the door and that it moves along the plot also. So they had to get that. What they did with us was you play the songs and we'll put you in a shot or two. And that's about what they did. <laughs> but who can complain when we had six cuts on a multi, multi, multi platinum? Well, and and even with that, I mean, I think even like 
Luke's youngest, you stand out. They, you didn't just sort of play. I mean, everybody knows who Johnny Casino and the Gamblers are from that movie. Anyone who loves the movie. You weren't just shuffled along. You're still- Well, a I'd like to, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I sang Rock and Roll is Here to Stay and did not appear in one play. <laughs> wow. So can't, you go, oh, we're soundtrack. Yes. Yeah, we're soundtrack for the dancers and that's what they were shooting and that's what they had to do. So they'd fit us in here and there, but uh, between the Woodstock movie and the Grease movie and the TV show, our success was always about audiovisual and had nothing to do with hit records on the radio. We tried to make some and we recorded some, but it wasn't, that's not what the career was about. You know, when we talk to people who have been in, in movies that have reached this sort of status of uh, iconic or made a record that is iconic, usually they say, well, I didn't see this coming. I'm surprised that people still want to talk about it so long after it happened. I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Greece and these other things, like, it must not surprise you since you know the the strength and the endurance that these songs have and so much you guys are so connected to that is that the case or are you still just like man we're still getting a check from greece it's a good day well we didn't know nobody knows at the time you're doing it what it's going to turn into mm -hmm. so so you can't you only have the benefit of hindsight later um we have played at the hollywood bowl to three sold out shows over the past 10 years that were for Greece's 40th anniversary, Greece's 45th anniversary. And we were the opening act to a movie <laughs> and 16,000 people paid whatever they paid, you know, and it's big numbers to watch a movie and oh. sing along to it and get us as the opening act. Uh, so the strength of that movie and, and all of that uh, unanticipated, um, but certainly the idea that our target audience when we began was kind of college kids and Woodstock hippies and us, people who weren't, it wasn't really our music. It was really people who graduated high school in 1957, who by 1969 were 30 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't going to the Fillmore East. You know, and they, that was not them. And yet the stars of rock and roll at that time, whether it was the Grateful Dead or Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin, yes, they were 30. They were 27, the magic death number for yeah. some of those people, but they were in their late 20s. Um, and and so we, we came in as younger brothers and sisters and cousins of the real audience for the music. And yet, over the years and through the TV show, there are people who watch the TV show that thought we wrote the songs. Because it's the first time they'd heard them. Right. Mm. Yeah. And and that's how strange life is. <laughs> and you go, yeah. Why is Freddie Cannon singing your song? Because he wrote it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's really rude of him to steal it. <laughs> yeah. It was rather thoughtless. I mean, but, uh, so we were always, um, there was a certain feeling among the original artists that they would dress in tuxedos to perform the music. And then here we're coming on in blue jeans and saddle shoes. And they'd say, you're kind of disrespectful of, you're not the real image. Mm. of what a 50s group was. The gold suits were Bye Bye Birdie and that. Yeah. Yeah. But the other guys were street guys. So no, we're not. We're as if regular people, not professionals, just guys off the street. And that's really who we were. We didn't, these guys didn't set out to be performers, except in this glee club fashion. And then they were remolded. And as I say, when they left, they would get replaced by guys who wanted a long professional music career. Anything to avoid work. <laughs> For 
more information, you can follow the group on Facebook, or if you're looking for CDs, photos, video, a whole bunch of stuff, check out their website, shanana.com. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website, and don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?